The title of this morning's message is Discovered a Signed Letter from Jesus of Nazareth. A Signed Letter of, from Jesus of Nazareth. Let me ask you this. Have you, ever, have you ever dreamed about finding a valuable antique at a flea market? Pay a real low price and you, you discover that, that it, it's really worth a lot of money. Well, a true story goes that in 1989, a bargain hunter up in New York bought a picture at a flea market for $4. And when he got it home, he, he, he took, flipped it over, looked at the back, and he, and he took the frame apart. And between the canvas and the frame, he found this paper all folded neatly. So he unfolds it, and he, and he gets all excited about it because what he has discovered, and he takes it to an authentic a person to authentic, authenticate these documents, it was one of the first 200 copies of our Declaration of Independence. Now, somebody had gotten it, put it between the frame and the canvas, hung it up, forgot about it, down through the generations. He buys it at a flea market for $4. When he has it authenticated and he discovers that it is an original, he sells it for over $2 million. Yeah. So, that is one of those things that you're, you're wishing for, that you find a rare antique and find out that it's worth a lot of money. This morning, though, I want, I want you to let your mind wander with me for a moment, okay? And I want us to imagine that there's an archaeologist, you're part of that archaeology dig, and you go near the city of Capernaum overseas, over in the Middle East, where Jesus walked. And in Galilee, you and that archaeologist, you find a clay jar, and it has a seal on it. And it's like the jars that contain, you remember the stories of the Dead Sea Scrolls where they found all the different scrolls of Isaiah and Jeremiah, the different prophets? Well, you find that. And you and the archaeologists, you take it to a, a lab. And using some of the latest and greatest scientific technology, they open that clay jar, and inside there, they find a scroll. It's made of papyrus. And it's perfectly intact. And as the scientists and you, part of the archaeology dig, you start to unroll the scroll, you discover that this letter is written to Simon Peter. And not only is it written to Simon Peter, but it's signed Jesus of Nazareth. Can you imagine what would happen in the scientific in the academic world if that was to happen. Now, no doubt that that letter, that papyrus scroll, would probably be one of the most valuable writings that has ever been found. Well, I stand before you this morning to tell you and to announce to you that there are such a letter. There is. Signed by Jesus of Nazareth, and it has been discovered. And I want to show you where you can find that letter from Jesus, signed by him. Are you interested in finding where it's at? Yeah? Look in a mirror. Look in a mirror. See, because today in our text, when we turn to our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we are going to see that we are a letter from Jesus Christ. Not to Simon Peter not to Andrew, not to James or any of the other guys, but we are a letter, a love letter, signed by Jesus to the world around us. I want to invite you to please stand with me. And while you're standing, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul the Apostle. Now remember, he's writing to the church there in Corinth. And in chapter 3, we th read these words. Are we beginning to condemn ourselves again? Or do we need, as some letters of condemnation, to you or from you? Then he says this in verse 2. You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. 
being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tables of stone, but on tables of human hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Paul's writing to the church there at Corinth. We thank you for this third chapter. And Father, help us today to see that we are love letters to the world. We're other kind of letters as we're going to see in the message, Father. So help us to see it. Help us to learn from it. Help us to apply it to our lives. And so that when people see us, they see Jesus Christ first. Speak to our hearts now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, you may be asking yourself, and you may be wanting to ask me, Pastor, where is this signed letter? Well, again, I say, look in the mirror. He's written it on your heart. You are a letter from Jesus Christ, and there are many beautiful metaphors. I love this. There, there, he's talking, Paul is using here in the Bible, he's talking that you and I as Christians, we're a letter. Had you ever thought of yourself as a letter? We are. Let's look at a couple other ones real quick. In John chapter 10, it says that Jesus is the good shepherd, and we are what? We are the sheep of his flock. In John chapter 15, Jesus is the vine and we are the what? We are the branches. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, Jesus is the cornerstone and we are the living stones. The Bible uses all kinds of metaphors about Jesus and where we fit in as Christians. Have you ever wondered why God uses so many different kinds of pictures to describe us? We're sheep, we're branches, we're living stones. Paul says that we're letters. I got to thinking about that as I was doing my message and preparing my message for this morning. And I think the reason why throughout the Bible that we are described in so many different ways like that and, and we're pictured in so many different ways is this. I believe that our, because of our relationship is so deep and so wonderful with God that just one single picture doesn't do justice. We have to be described as other ways. And so that's what we are. Now in this message this morning, I want us to focus on what it means for you and I to be letters from Christ. And I believe there's two important elements to this sermon. The first one is this. Every Christian, if you name the name of Christ, if you've been one time in your life, you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a Christian, you are Christ-like, you are a living letter. That's what you are. Now, some letters may have ul ul ulterior motives to them. I read one um, some time ago. It was, it was from a young lady by the name of Maria, and she was writing to her former fiancé, Jimmy. And here's what the letter said. It, it said, Dear Jimmy, words cannot express the deep unhappiness and regret I feel since I broke off our engagement last week. Please forgive me. Please take me back. I love you. I love you. Love forever, Marie. Now, here comes the motive. P.S. Congratulations on winning the lottery. Marie had a hidden motive for that. Folks, I don't want you to miss this. The only motive God has for you and I as being a letter is that we communicate his life-changing and his life-loving message to other people. That's what he wants from us. That's his only motive. Christian, your motive, the motive of God for you is to tell other people about Jesus Christ and what he's done in your life and what he can do in theirs. That's all it is. I want us this morning to take a moment and analyze this, these different components of a letter. You remember when you used to write letters? 
you know, today we, we pull out the cell phone and we text. We not only text, but a few years before that, we sent emails. We still do send emails. But now the main thing is texting. But before texting and before emails, in the olden days, <laughs> we wrote letters. And I want us to see here, I want us to analyze the components of this metaphor of you and I being a letter. The first one is this. The pen, you have a piece of paper and you have an ink pen. Okay? I'm going to pull one out of my pocket and I click it. The pen in our letter is the Holy Spirit. Before the days of typewriters and computer printers, people wrote letters by using a pen. Some would use pencils, but mainly you'd use an ink pen. And the pen transferred the ink from that little cartridge in here to the paper. And folks, that is what the Holy Spirit does. When he comes in to live in your life and my life, he transfers the life of Jesus Christ into you and I. And whatever we do, whatever we say, people see that letter. People see the letter in the ink of the Holy Spirit. Now, the next part of the letter writing in the old days was a piece of paper. It wasn't a little telephone that you text on. It wasn't the computer that you sent an email on. It was a piece of paper. You had it laying before you. And in Old Testament time, God, it says, first wrote his law on the tablets of stone. But now in the age of grace, God is writing his life on human hearts. Since the day that you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, God started writing on your heart. And what's in the heart proceeds out of the mouth, amen? If you have Jesus inside your heart and you're living for him, you're walking for him, you're reading his word, you're praying to him, it comes out of your heart and through your mouth and through your actions and other people see him. He is communicating through us the feelings, the thoughts, and the desires of God. In this age of computer, I, and I, learn, I had to learn this, okay? I didn't know it, had to learn it. But in this age of computers, they, they've come up with, with a couple new terms, and, and, and they're new to maybe to you and me, but the first one was writable. You ever hear that? It's a program. It's, it's some disks that are writable. And what that means is that they're capable of receiving data and, and, and being written upon. Then there's the unwritable. Now, guess what that means? It means that you can't receive any data from it. You can't put anything on it. Okay? Let me ask you this, and I want you to answer this in your heart. How, and I'm going to use this term, I know some English teacher may go, oh my goodness, that's not correct grammar, but I'm going to say it anyway. How writable is your heart? Do you receive the data, the Word of God, into your heart where it changes you and it has you to do things? Or is your heart so full of other things that there's no room for God to write on your heart? his word, and his message. We should constantly be allowing God to write his message on the pages of our hearts. You're never too old. You're, you've never gone far enough in the Christian life. Okay? You never go far enough in the Christian life for God to write new things on your heart. The third element is this, the reader. Now, you had the ink pen, you had the paper, you took thoughts from your head, put it down through the ink, onto the paper, and what comes next? The reader. Who's the reader? Well, according to Scripture, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says that we are known and read by all men. Or let me modernize it just a moment. Same meaning. We are known and read by all mankind. That way nobody's left out. Men and women, boys and girls, they see our lives. 
Now, sometimes you may receive a letter in the mail, and on it, it's, they have a stamp, and it says personal. Okay, or maybe somebody just wrote on there, personal. And what that means is it's written and to be open and read by only the name on that envelope, right? Nobody else can open it, nobody else can read it, or nobody else should. I'll put it that way. It is a private letter, personal letter to you only. But there's another kind of letter, and we have all heard that. It's called an open letter. Now, who gets that? Everybody. It's an open letter. Everybody gets one. It basically says the same thing. Everybody receives it in the mailbox, they pop it open, they pull it out, and they read it. Okay? It's not just to a particular person. Please don't miss this. The Bible says that you and I, as Christians, we are an open letter. We are an open letter for all mankind to read. As we walk through the stores, as we go wherever, whenever we do anything, whatever we say, we are an open letter. So that's what it means. It means wherever we go, whatever we say, whatever we do, people are reading your life and mine. And you, we cannot, as Christians, we cannot be a close Christian because you, you are really, to some people, I want you to catch this. To some people, you are the only Bible that some people will ever read. You're the only one. They may not have been blessed enough to have a mom and dad or grandma or grandparents that were Christians. Okay? They may not have been blessed enough to have brothers and sisters that were Christians and they had a Bible in their house. I heard a radio show, it was a talk show, a call-in talk show, about a year ago. And this preacher was being interviewed, and he was talking about the Bible. And this caller had called in, and he said, where do you get one of those things? Now, this man that called in was not a little kid. He was a grown adult. And the pastor and the interviewer, the reporter, were kind of taken back. And, and the pastor said, what do you mean one of those things? He said, you've been talking about this Bible. He said, where did you buy one? Now, folks, this was not in Africa. This was not in some little island out on some Pacific coastline somewhere. You know where this radio station, was? this pastor was being interviewed from? You ready for this? St. Louis. Right here in the heart of America. It's not like we have to get on some plane and fly for hours and hours and hours to get there. We get in our car right now and it takes us, what, 45 minutes to an hour? And we're in St. Louis. There is a person, there is a man in St. Louis, and I'm willing to, to guess that there's other men and women, boys and girls, that they don't know where to get one of these. And so when you and I say that we're Christians, you and I are are the only Bible that they see. What you say you believe and how you act and how you do things either confirms what you say or it denies what you say. The fourth, fourth part of that letter is the signature. Now, I write you a letter, dear whoever, and I say different things, and at the very end, in ink, not a text, not an email, but a letter I put on there, like I do a lot of my letters, in him or in Christ, Bruce. Now, here's the difference. In biblical times, and especially if we were to look at the first few words of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, what, how did the letter start? This was a letter. See, Paul wrote first in 2 Corinthians. He wrote this letter to the church there at Corinth. How did he start it out? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We do it just the opposite. Pete, Mary, and then at the bottom, in him or sincerely, whatever, and we tack our name in. In biblical times, they put 
their names first, who it came from. And then many times to the church of Corinth, Ephesus, Colossae, wherever. When you and I are living letters of Jesus, and that's what we are if we're Christians, the first thing people will read is your life is Jesus Christ. Because you say, I'm a Christian. I'm Christ-like. I'm a Christian. I'm a little Jesus. I'm a little Christ. And so that's who they pick up on. Well, if you, let's see. Valley says he's a Christian. But man, he acts like this. He, you know, talks like that. Well, now if he's a Christian, now the non-believers out there, and they say to themselves, well, if Valley says he's a Christian and he acts like that and talks like that and he does business like that, then that's probably what Jesus does. I'm either going to show a good representation of who Jesus is or I'm going to show a poor one. But I do so by what I say. Now, you take a, let's, let's have another object lesson here. You, you take a baseball. We all like baseball. We all like the Cardinals. There are some that like other teams, but that's okay. We'll pray for them. But we like the Cardinals. Now, I go out and buy a baseball. Just go into the store and buy a baseball. I'm going to spend anywhere from $20 on up for a, a league-sized ball. And that's about all it's worth. That's all it's worth. Between 20 and, well, let's say between $20 and $40 for a baseball. But now, let's take that same baseball and we go to a signing place where there's, the Cardinals are signing balls, baseballs. And I get in line, and you remember old Whitey Herzog, the coach? And I'm, getting, I'm in his line. Now here's this, let's say, between $20 and $40 baseball. And I, it's my turn, so I get in front of, you know, and I, I make it to the front of the line, and I shake hands with him. Hopefully somebody's off to the side, and they've taken my picture shaking hands with him. And I hand him that baseball, and I say, you know, Mr. Mr. Herzog, will you sign this? And he takes out an ink pen or a black magic marker, and he writes on there, Whitey Herzog. And he hands it back to me. Now, that baseball that, let's say, I spent $25 for just went from $25 to $120. Is it the baseball? No. It's the signature on the baseball that makes the difference. The difference is the signature. Now, I want to say this. If you are a Christian, well, see, let's go this way. Before you were a Christian, you were a lost person. Our lives were not worth a whole lot. Okay? Because we were sinners. But... The day we accepted Christ, the day you and I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, on our hearts went the name Jesus of Nazareth. We became something very precious and something very valuable. Not because of us. We're like that old baseball. But because of that signature. We carry the signature of Jesus. The second important part the second important element is this what kind of message are we sending now this is another one of those questions that you answer to yourself and in your own heart what kind of message are you sending to the world around you let me ask you this have you ever heard the expression the medium is the message Did you ever hear that well that 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 phrase, the medium is the message, it was coined back in 1964. A gentleman had written a book about understanding media, television, radio, newspaper. And in simple terms, it means that if a company advertises on television, we'll say, the fact that they can afford television commercial time communicates the message itself. Okay? They are a strong company, and in that case, the medium, the way it gets out, is what? Television. 
Television is the message. My goodness, if whatever company can advertise on television, they, may be a, they must be a pretty good company because they're on television. And heaven forbid we all know that television doesn't lie. That's not an amen, that's an oh me. <laughs> and because it happens all the time. But in the spiritual side, God is in the changing business. He uses people with the message to change lives as the medium of his message. How does his message get out? By you and I. We're the medium. We're telling others. Because remember what I said earlier, you may be the only Bible that some people see. None other. Before our Lord ascended back into heaven, he had his disciples around him, and he said this. He said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Now, that witnesses, if you want, you can substitute living letters. Okay? You're my living letters. Both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. You are his living letters. You're his witnesses. People are seeing your life and you reflect the name of Jesus Christ and so that's what they're looking at. Now God could have used angels to send out the message of the gospel, but what did he do instead? He chose you and I to be the medium of his message to tell people about Jesus Christ. Now this morning, I want us to look at four different kinds of letters that God wants you and I to be. Okay, we're not only a letter, but we're four kinds. The first kind is this, God wants us to be a warning letter. Now sometimes an employee who is not performing well at his task or her task, they receive a warning letter from the boss. Okay, and basically it says, ship up or shape up or ship out either start doing your job or i'm going to have to fire you and hire somebody else or let's say we don't pay our phone bill what happens well it goes on and goes on for a while and all of a sudden you get a little letter from the telephone company and it says to you either pay your bill which you owe this much or your telephone service electric service whatever will be shut off and if you don't pay it, you don't enjoy whatever. And nobody, nobody enjoys receiving a warning letter. Nobody does. It's really not fun, is it, to receive that warning letter. But the Bible makes it clear that sometimes your job and my job is to warn people. And what do we warn them? Here's what we warn them. That after they die, they will either spend eternity with God or they're going to spend eternity in a real place called hell. That's a warning letter. You either change your life and turn your life over to Christ and let Him live through you, let Him be your Lord and Savior, and when you die, you will spend all eternity with Him. But if you don't do that, if you reject Him, you're going to spend all eternity, yeah, but you're going to spend all eternity in a place called hell. And guys, just for your sake, because I've, never, I've heard very few women say this, I've heard more guys say, well, if I die and go to hell, I'll just be there with my buddies and we'll have a good old party. No. Let me tell you, please, 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 guys, don't, don't miss this. When you die and you've rejected Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, yes, you're going to go to hell, but you're not going to be there with your buddies and you're not going to have a super party. It's going to be miserable. Now, by me just saying that, guess what? I was a warning letter. I was a warning letter. I informed them. I informed you what happens if you don't accept Jesus Christ. 
Now, that doesn't mean you have to stand on a street corner wearing, you remember the old sandwich board signs that they used to wear? It doesn't mean you have to wear one of those and stand on the corner and start screaming, repent, or you perish. I mean, you can if you want, but it doesn't mean that. What it means is this. When we, you and I are warning letters, it means that we should lovingly remind people that the Bible says over in Hebrews 9.27, inasmuch as it is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes judgment. Very clear. If we were to go over to Ezekiel, and I, and I love that book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 3, God talks about his children. He compares his children to being watchmen posted on the wall. They were there to warn the, the population when an enemy army was approaching. And in Ezekiel 33, it says, if a man didn't sound the alarm, he was responsible for the deaths of his fellow citizens. You're the watchman on the wall. Your job, when you see the enemy approaching, is to blast on that horn and to wake up the population and get them ready because there's a war going on. And God makes a spiritual application about warning others. He says... When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade him or her from his or her way. That wicked man will die for his sin. He says this. He says, but I will hold you accountable for his blood. Now, that doesn't mean if you die, when, if you die after him, you're going to go to hell for it. No, it doesn't mean that. It means God's going to look at you and say, I put you together. Why didn't you share Christ? You're going to be held accountable. He says, but, but, if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not do so, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourselves. I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I'm using a fictitious person, Pete. Pete is a wicked guy. And I know he's wicked. I know he's sinful. I know he hasn't accepted Christ. And God works in a God way that it's just me and Pete. And Pete even says something about God. And I don't say a word. I don't tell him what Christ has done in my life. Pete dies for his own sins. We all, you know, what I mean, if you're a sinner, you do that on your own. But when I go to heaven, God's going to look at me and say, Valley, I set up a perfect appointment between you and Pete. Pete even gave a lead-in about God, about me. Why didn't you say something? And I don't have an excuse. I didn't want to offend him. No. We need to be sharing Christ with others. Now let me say this about sharing Christ with people. It is not our job to convert them. That belongs to God. If I convert anybody, they're in trouble. If you convert somebody, they're in trouble. Our job is to tell them about Jesus Christ and we let God convert them. Then they're his disciple. And that's better. It's our job just to warn them. That's our job. The second letter is this. God wants us to be a thank you letter. Now, I don't know anybody that doesn't like to receive a thank you letter. I think everybody likes to receive a th thank you letter for something that they've done somewhere along the way. Now, if you go by proper etiquette for a thank you letter, they say that it is appropriate for you to handwrite it and it should be written within 72 hours of the event or the deed that you want to express thanks. I remember way back in the 80s, the, the first President Bush, President Bush 41, this guy was well known for his habit of writing thousands and thousands of handwritten little thank you notes. He always carried them with him 
or somebody carried him with him. And he would meet you and, and talk with you and, and, you know, you did something, whatever it was, whether it was in the campaign or you just helped him or whatever, quickly, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush 41, would take out a little card. He would get somehow get your name and address, and he would write you a little thank you note. Thank you for your wonderful comment. Thank you for your encouraging words. Thank you for telling me that you pray for me. And he would mail it off. He did that all his life, and that was one of the things he credited that as one of the things that his mother taught him to do. To always thank people for what they've done. The Bible says that you and I are living thank you letters. Now, the third letter is this. God wants you and I to be an invitation letter. I think everybody, they think it's nice, and they, they, they get a letter in the mail. They go out to the mailbox or to the post office, and they pull out a stack of papers, and here's one of those little special ones. You know, it's shaped different. And you've heard through, and we'll use this term, you've heard through the grapevine that this event's going to happen or that event's going to happen. And there it says your name, and you open it up, and it's an invitation to whatever the event is. And with nobody around, you even kind of smile. And here's why, because you and I feel special. We feel special because in that, that event, whatever that happening is in that person's life, they consider you a friend and they care about you enough that they want you to enjoy whatever's going on in their lives, whether it's a, a birth of a baby, a marriage, whatever. Wow, so-and-so cared enough about me to invite me to this event in their lives. Our lives should be living letters, inviting people to enjoy the abundant life of Jesus Christ and knowing God. In one parable, Jesus described the Christian life as a great banquet. And he said, And then the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and the byways along the edges and compel people to come in so that my house may be full. God invites everyone to join the banquet, doesn't he? Folks, listen. You will never see a sign that says no room filled up. You'll never see it. It'll never happen with God. God invites everyone to come in and to join in the banquet. The Bible says, whosoever may come, and we are his living invitation letters. We need to invite people to come to Jesus Christ. How many times have you and I been put in those God situations where somebody, whether in the doctor's office, the dentist's office, the, to get your car repaired, at the barber shop, wherever, and somebody says something about God and about Jesus Christ, and you're sitting there, you should say something. Be that living invitation letter. To just ask them, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Now, they're either going to say one or two things, yes, I do, or no, I don't. And if they say, no, I don't, just look at them lovingly. You all have wonderful smiles. Smile at them and say, well, can I tell you what he's done in my life? Now, once again, they only have two answers. Yes, you can, or no, you can't. And if they say, no, I don't want to hear it, or no, fear not. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus Christ. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting him. But if they say, yes, what has he done in your life? And then you share with them what he's done. How your life was a little bit before. How you got to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Did you hear a preacher on TV? Were you here in a church and the preacher was preaching a message? Was it by a friend, by a neighbor, a parent, a sibling? Did you read it just in a book? Here is how I invited Jesus Christ into my life. Here's how it was before. Don't spend a lot of time there. 
How did I meet Jesus? And then the final part, here's what my life has been like since knowing Jesus Christ. It hasn't always been a bed of roses. Life hasn't always been perfect. Still pay the bills. Still have unruly kids or grandkids. Still have to get up every morning, go to work, pay the bills. Car breaks down, whatever. But I know that even though those things happen in my life, I know God is with me. And he'll see me through it somehow, some way. The fourth letter is this. God wants, to be a, wants you and I to be a love letter because we're sharing his love. I think it's neat to receive love letters, don't you? Can you med- remember back when, when your spouse or, or someone would send you a love letter and how all excited you got? I think one of the greatest romances that I ever studied about in literature took place between a lady by the name of Elizabeth Barrett and the man that would become her other part, her her husband, Robert Browning. She became Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And you may not know a lot about what Elizabeth Barrett Barrett Browning wrote, but as soon as I say this, you're going to go, I heard that. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. We've all heard that. And in that poem, she goes on and tells about how she loves this guy. And and it's a neat little poem. It really is. It's a neat love letter to him. But you know what? As great as love letter as Elizabeth Barrett Browning's How Do I Love Thee letter, it doesn't compare to the matchless, unconditional love that God has for you and I. God so loved the world, wait a minute, God so loved Bruce Valley, you can put your name in there, that he sent his only begotten son, his one and only son, to die on this world for me. Why? So Bruce Valley would not perish but have everlasting life. That's how much he loved me. You're talking about a love letter. That's a love letter. And now God wants us to be a living love letter. Look with me over to John's Gospel. Turn in your Bible over to John's Gospel, the 13th chapter. The first part of it is the Lord's Supper. Then we have Jesus predicts his uh, his betrayal. Now look down to verse 34. John chapter 13, look with me at verse 34. Jesus says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. And he doesn't stop there, does he? Look at verse 35. He says this, By this, some of the men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Did I read that correctly? No, I did not. 35 says, By this, all, A-L-L, All men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not some of the people, some of the time. He said all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Well, let me leave you with this story. I read about it here recently, and supposedly it's a true story. It's a true story about a man named Daryl. Daryl was 40 years old. He had never gotten married. He wasn't a very attractive guy. He was kind of shy, introvert, we'll call him. But he loved working with the young people in his church. Just loved it. And the youth department finally agreed that what they were going to do, they were going to start this project, and, and, and monthly, once a month, they were going to go to some nursing home and do a church service there for those the people that lived in the nursing home when i see daryl didn't like going to nursing homes he didn't like being around older sick people just didn't like it 
But because he liked working with the youth and the young people at his church, they asked him if he would drive the van, if he would drive them from the church to the nursing home. So he agreed. So at the very first service that they had, Daryl did not sit up front. He didn't sit with the group. He didn't sit with the patients there at the nursing home. He stood in the very back and leaned up against the wall. And while the service was going on and they were doing the singing and the giving testimonies, all of a sudden, he felt someone take his hand. And Daryl looked down and here's this older gentleman. The guy's eyes were closed. And Daryl just stood there holding the guy's hand. He didn't know if the guy was hearing, if he could speak, if he could see, nothing. He didn't know anything about this guy. But he just let the older gentleman hold his hand. And when the service was ended, Daryl was still holding the man's hand. And, and before he realized it, he leaned over to the elderly gentleman and he said, I've got to go now, but I'll be back, I promise. Well, the next month he went. And again, he's sitting in the very back of the room. And all of a sudden, here comes the hand. And he takes Daryl's hand, and Daryl holds his hand. And at the end of the service, Daryl again says, I will be back. I've got to go now. I promise I'll be back. And Daryl says that before he knew it, he looked at the man, and he said, I love you. And as he was walking out of the nursing home, he thought to himself, as we do sometimes, where did that come from? Why would I say that to this guy? But Daryl returned back, and it continued on for several months and several months. And then finally one day, the, the young people are there. Daryl's back there. He's leaning up against the wall, but there's no hand that reaches out to him. So Daryl sees one of the nurses, and he asks her about the gentleman. And in the process of all those months, he found out that the guy's name was Oliver. And she said, follow me. And she led him to Oliver's room, and Oliver was laying in bed, and it was obvious that he was dying. But Daryl sat down beside him, and he, he took his hand. And there was no response to him. But Daryl just sat there, didn't say anything, just sat there and held his hand. And finally, the, the youth minister came to Daryl and said, Daryl, we've got to go. And Daryl leaned over, and he said, I've got to go. I promise I'll be back. I love you, Oliver. And he felt a little squeeze on his hand. And with this, Daryl's eyes just filled with tears. And Daryl stumbled out of the room. And as he was stumbling out of the room with all the tears in his eyes, he bumped into this young woman who was entering. And Daryl, of course, he's got tears in his eyes and he apologizes for doing it. And she says, that's okay. She said, in matter of fact, she said, I've been waiting for you to come out of his room. She said, I've been watching you. She said, you see, I'm Oliver, as you know him. I'm his granddaughter. And she said, when the doctors told me that he didn't have that much time to live and that he was probably going to make it through the night, not even make it through the night, she said, I started sitting with him. And she said, the nurses even told her, well, your grandfather will probably not even speak a word. But she said, a little ways into the night, Oliver opened up his eyes and looked at her, and in a clear voice, he said, tell Jesus goodbye for me. And she said, but, but Grandpa, and she was choking back tears, she said, she said, but Grandpa, I don't have to say goodbye to Jesus for you. She said, you'll soon be with him, and you'll get to say hello to him. Not goodbye, but Hello. And she said her grandpa out there, eyes lit up again, and he smiled. And he said, I know. But he said, you don't understand. Every month, once a month, Jesus comes and holds my hand. And he said, and Jesus tells me he loves me, and I'll be back. He said, I'm just afraid that, that if I go away, he won't come. And she said, Grandpa, he'll be there. And the young lady told Daryl, she said, I want you to know, she said, uh, the nurses told me that it was you that was holding his hand every month. 
She said, so on behalf of Grandpa and myself, she goes, I want to thank you for being there for him, for being his Jesus for him, to hold his hand and to say, I love you. And she said, I can imagine that Jesus is glad to have someone like you mistaken for him. She said, I know my grandfather was. She said, and I am. She kissed Daryl on the cheek, and, and within an hour or so, Oliver slipped to be in, in the hands of the Lord. But you see, in that little story, Daryl was a love letter to Oliver for Christ. That's what he was. He was a love letter. Let me ask you this morning this. Has anyone ever mistaken you for Jesus because of the love you've shown to them? Could you imagine that? By the way you act, by the way you did things, by the way you helped them, whatever, somehow in their minds, they mistaken you and I for Jesus because of our love for them. Let's remember this morning People are reading your life every day. Every day they're reading your life. You are either a warning letter, you're a thank you letter, you're an invitation letter, you're a love letter. There's a little poetic story that says this, you are, a, you are writing a gospel a chapter each day by deeds that you do and words that you say. Men, women, and children read what you are writing. What is your letter? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we can come into your house and study your word. Father, help us to be a, a letter. Help us to be the only Bible that some people will see. And by what we say, by what we do, help them to see you first. Father God, sometimes we are a warning letter. We have to warn them of what will come if they do not accept you as Lord and Savior. Sometimes we're a thank you letter. Sometimes we're an invitation letter inviting them to come to the banquet to come and meet Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And sometimes, like old Daryl, well, Father, sometimes we're just a love letter to people around us. Father, help us to be a living letter for you. Because as the story went, People are watching. They're watching us every single day. Day in, day out. Father, help us to be that love letter for you. That invitation letter. Father, I pray that for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that today they heard that warning. As Hebrews 9.27 9, says, as it is appointed for men to die once, after that comes judgment. If they do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Father, help them to understand, help them to hear the warning that they will spend eternity in a real place called hell. But if they accept Christ, as Lord and Savior. They invite him in to come into their lives and take control of them, their lives and to forgive them of their sins. They will spend all eternity with him. Father, help us as Christians to, to resolve within ourselves to be invitation letters, to love letters, and yes, even warning letters. Whatever the case may be but help us to do it with a pure motive of loving them as you love them. In Christ's name we pray.